Y'all know what's going on. It's time for another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker. Look here, y'all. This episode is going to be a doozy, man. I'm going to share something about myself uh, that uh, I haven't really shared with anybody because for one reason, the the realization of what happened to me and how this lesson came to me, it came at the most inconvenient time, right? But I had to accept the reality for what it was, right? But I'm going to share this story with you uh, about when I got caught with a cell phone in prison, right? It's a doozy, y'all. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show, y'all. All right, check it out, y'all, man. In the penitentiary, cell phones are contraband. Everybody knows that, right? So when you're getting a phone call from somebody in your family that you love from a cell phone, just be advised. If it's not a tablet given to them by the state, they break the rules, right? And I was known for breaking the rules, you know what I'm saying, back in my day. And I I really didn't see anything wrong with having a cell phone. I really, really didn't, right? So I, any opportunity that I had, I would try to get me one. And they cost a lot of money. I paid as low as uh, $100 for one and as high as 1000 for a cell phone, touchscreen. You know what I'm saying? That's just what it was. At one time... Uh, in here, I had four cell phones when I was at this other facility. It was just in case, you know, you got to have a backup in case something goes wrong because something always goes wrong in prison. But look here, not too many years ago, right, before I went all the way straight, I had a cell phone. And uh, I would just do my thing. I would call home and talk to my baby. I would call home and talk to my family, friends, get in touch with people that I hadn't been in touch with in years because... When you use the state phones, you can only call 10 people, right? They can't call you. It's no leaving, no messages and none of that kind of stuff and all that kind of, and it's very restrictive, right? And it makes it really, really hard for you to stay in touch with a lot of people in your life. You know what I'm saying? Um, plus no internet access on state phones. You don't get to, you know what I'm saying? Stay current as, the, as far as what's going on. No social media, no any of that, right? So let me tell you this story, y'all. I had this cell phone, right? And I was just kicking it. And I would only get the cell phone out on Thursdays. You know what I'm saying? I'd get it out on Thursdays. And usually, coming about the weekend, about Thursdays, is when the you know the search teams and all of those teams like it, they start to slack up a little bit, right? And I figured, shoot, what's the point? Because normally, normally, let me just keep it 100. Normally, I would get it out on Friday afternoons. But this particular week, Leading up to this particular week, it had been about three weeks, I started to notice a pattern. I'm like, wait a minute, they're not even coming around as much as they used to. So I said, let me go on and start getting it out on Thursday. So I got it out on Thursday. I'm calling people that I care about. I'm talking to them and whatnot. And lo and behold, oh my God, here we go. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's like, why are you changing your routine? Why are you changing your pattern? You know, did nobody in my family, nobody, my girl, nobody wanted me to have the phone anyway. You feel what I'm saying? Nobody. It was always like they would ha- be happy to hear from me, but it'd be like, boy, what is wrong with you? Ain't you going to learn? When are you going to learn? Them folks ain't playing with you. You know what I'm saying? And at this particular time, I was I was doing okay. You know what I'm saying? I was doing okay. So I started to get the phone out on Thursdays. I got it out this particular Thursday. And lo and behold, one day I'm sitting in on the phone and I'm on Facebook Live. I'm kicking it. You know what I'm saying? And I'm doing one of my shows, actually, that I was doing on Facebook Live, talking to this group, you know what I'm saying, of, of, of parents that had uh, individuals in prison. You know what I'm saying? And um, I would always talk to them like at 630. And I would make sure that it would be private. And if they shared it with anybody, then I wouldn't talk to them anymore. And all of those kind of stuff, all kind of parameters were put in place to try to protect myself. But again, as I've always said in some of my other episodes, there is no right way to do wrong, okay? So I'm ignoring my own advice at this point because I was feeling good. A phone gives you that sense of independence. You feel what I'm saying? It gives you that sense of control of your own destiny. You know what I'm saying? Control of your own fate. It makes me feel, at this particular time anyway, it makes me feel as if I was in control of something. And it was an illusion. It was an illusion. Because this is what happened, y'all. One day, when I was on the phone, I heard a knock at my door. You know what I'm saying? Somebody knocked on the door. 
And I turned around and looked. Now, I got the phone in the corner, right? I'm on Facebook Live. I got the phone in the corner. And I said, hold on, y'all. And I looked. And somebody came to the door. I'm not going to say the person's name. But anyway, they came to the door, opened up the door, and said, here you go, bro. And they handed me um, some food. Now, wait a minute. I hadn't told this person I wanted any food. I hadn't said anything about needing anything, right? But they, you know, they were known. They make raps pretty good, you know what I'm saying? And I throw a comment at them one day, like, let me get in on that one day. Oh, yeah, whatever. Whenever whenever you all uh, see me cooking, just bring some over, blah, blah, blah. I got you, I got you. But I didn't do that this day. I didn't do that. But this person felt like, I guess, okay, let me go on and, and take bro something, you know, and uh, so he can taste it and see how he likes it and all this and that, right? So they dropped a couple of burritos on my desk. Now, what I wasn't paying attention to is out of my periphery, I didn't see if that person had been on the door and how long they had been on the door, watching me talking to a while. Now, I want to paint this picture so you can get an idea, right? I'm sitting at a desk and this desk is blocked by a shelf, right? But the seat on the table that's connected to the desk is further back than the shelf. So you, if you looked in the window, you would see a person sitting on a seat talking to the wall, right? So, and if you didn't know that I was on the phone, you'd think, oh, he's lost his mind. All these years, he finally got into a joke. You know what I'm saying? So, while I'm sitting here talking on Facebook Live, I never paid attention to the door because I'm merely paying attention to make sure the sounds of the pod don't change, meaning police don't walk in. Because somebody walk in, somebody will yell out, fire in the hole. That lets everybody that's in the in that unit, in that building, is doing anything wrong. Look, they're in here, clean up. But I didn't hear that. So I'm sitting there talking. I don't know how long that person had been at my door watching me. So finally, that person knocks, opens up the door before I said anything. Because when he knocked, I just turned towards him. He opened up the door and he put some burritos on my tape. So here you go, bro. But I noticed something when I looked at him. We caught eye to eye. He had that look in his eye. I'm like, I've seen that look before. I have seen that look before. And that was the look of somebody that was up to something. So here's the plot. I don't pay attention to that. My gut is telling me, danger, Will Robinson, danger. I don't even pay attention to that. So I kept on going with the show. Finished up the show. Instead of taking that phone and putting it up somewhere, I feel like, okay, I'm going to ride out tonight. Police ain't been making their rounds anyway like that. I'm going to ride out tonight. So I ride out. I'm on the phone. I'm taking care of some business and stuff like that, you know, because I was still doing stuff. I ain't have no business, y'all. I'm taking care of some business up to about 11, 30, 12 o'clock. I guess, something like that. Then I get tired and I put it up. But I don't put it up. I just laid it beside my head in the bed in the corner. And I fell out, fell asleep, gone. And then all of a sudden, the next sound I heard was somebody else knocking on the door and the door opened and the lights are turned on and it's the police. Guess what they said? T-shirts boxers, and socks. And if you've listened to my episodes, you'll know that when they come in and they want you to strip search and shake down, that's what they say to you. So I woke, I woke up and I sat up in the bed and I'm looking at this officer. And I know who this officer is, you know what I'm saying, by name rather. And I'm looking at him and I freeze. I'm trying to figure out, do I fade him? What do I do? What do I say? And he looks at me again and in a stern voice, he said, T-shirts, boxers, and socks. About this time, I sat there on the top bunk. He jumps down. He starts to strip. I don't move. Now, the officer looks at me again, and he puts his hand on his radio. And he said, Baker, get up. It's over. When he said that, y'all, I'm talking about, look, I felt this feeling in my stomach. And I said, I know that feeling. It's when you've been caught. You didn't pay attention to the signs. 
and ain't nothing that you can do about it. It's about to go down. And at that point, I'm trying to make up my mind. Do I reach for this phone and smash it? Or do I just stand up and hope that he don't find it? So I stood up. And I started to pull my sweats, because I sleep in my sweatpants, right? I, pulled, I stood up and I pulled my sweatpants down, and he looked at me. My cellar had already finished stripping and stepped out. He looked at me. He said, are you straight? I said, you know I'm not straight. I'm not going to go through that. So I took all my clothes off, put my T-shirts and my boxers and my socks back on, stepped outside. When I stepped outside the cell, I see about 12 people outside the cell downstairs, everybody sitting on the floor, hands behind their backs, legs crossed, facing uh, one way, nobody's looking. Nobody's looking up. And I'm like, man, I missed all the signs. So I started replaying everything in my mind, everything that happened. When the dude came to my door, dropped off the food, the look he gave me, this, this, and that, I'm like, ah, I missed it. I missed it. This dude got me. This dude got me. And I just put my head down, and I'm shaking my head. Now, my seller, he's sitting next to me, right? And he looks at me, and he said, you straight? I said, nah, I'm due. I'm hit. He said, dang. I said, yeah, man. He said, man, I wonder how they knew. I said, I already know how they knew. I already know. So later on, a few days later, you know, I get the write-up, of course, blah, blah, blah. All this and that. They hit me up. I'm found guilty. You know, blah, blah, blah. You know, all this and that, right? And a few days later, the pieces of the puzzle start coming together because people starting to say certain things. You know what I'm saying? And now... I get out of the hole and everything is done. And I'm knowing now somebody had told on me. And I'm knowing this particular person's name that gave me that food. His name keep coming up every single time. His name is coming up every single time. But I didn't need anybody to tell me that. I knew it. I knew it. So I ended up being in close proximity with this dude. You feel what I'm saying? And I knew he had told on me. The guys that I work with, they're telling me, Joe, let it go. Leave it alone. Forget it. Don't worry about it. This, this, is Everybody that mess with me is telling me to let it go. But I couldn't let it go, y'all. Couldn't let it go. I'm plotting. I want to get him. I want to whoop him. Then the officer that popped me, he stepped to me. He saw me one day. And he said, you're not looking right. I said, what you talking about, man? Now, I'm five hours hot at him, too. You know what I'm saying? I don't even know why I'm hot at him. He the police. He's doing his job. I don't know why I'm mad at him. But I said, what you mean? He said, whatever you got on your mind, he said, let it go. Take your lick. You played. You got caught. That's the end of it. That needs to be the end of it. You need to learn to receive correction. I'm knowing what he's saying is right. I don't want to hear what he has to say. I don't want to hear nothing that he has to say. He the Fed rat is. But he was right. And he said, you need to be thinking about your family and all this and that, right? And don't worry about anything else. So when he said that, it confirmed to me that they had information. Now I'm really thinking about this dude. But as time goes on, I don't get shipped. They leave me alone. They put me in a better job. It turns out to be a better job anyway. And time goes on, and I'm just chilling. I'm cool. I'm chilling. But I've seen this dude every now and then. And he started to, hey, Joe, how you doing? What's going on? And at first, I'm like, I wanted to spit on him. I wanted to spit on him and just you suck. You know what I mean? Wreck. I wanted to say all that. My, this is going on in my head. I want to say all of these things to him. But I'm looking at him and I'm thinking about what that officer said. Leave it alone. You played, you got caught, take your lick. I'm looking at him. And I left it alone, y'all. In my mind, I didn't. And in my heart, I didn't. So one day, months later, 
somebody that knew he told on me, they asked me a question. Said, have you forgiven him yet? I said, what? Man, no, I ain't forgave him. They said, you need to forgive him. I said, why? Don't you want to be forgiven? I'm like, yeah. Then forgive him. Man, look here. I felt like a fool because I'm like, man, this ain't even the same. I started rationalizing. I said, this ain't the same as committing the type of crime. I committed murder, y'all. I said, this ain't the same. This is two different levels. Right? He knew what I was saying. He looked at me. He said, no, it ain't. No, it ain't. Forgiveness is forgiveness, man. You got to do it, man. He said, you need to look at the lesson in that. You need to receive that correction. You kept playing. He said, you got all these good things going, but then you still skirting on the edges. He said, quit it. Quit playing. He said, you can't be no hypocrite, Joe. And think good going to come to you. Even if nobody ever knows about it, ain't no good going to come while you being a hypocrite, man. He said, because you ain't dealt with what's going on inside of you. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. Who you talking to? I'm looking at him. Now I start to think about, I don't want to hear that. You know what I'm saying? You got all kinds of, you know what I'm saying? These ideas of things is what's going on. This, But he was right. He was right. So a few days ago, I'm fast forwarding, right? Because I, I ended up saying that I forgave him. And I moved on and I would speak to him. I ended up playing ball with him. You know, all kinds of stuff and all this and that. And I moved on, right? I moved on. But a few days ago, y'all, I was sitting around, chilling. And I was thinking. I was listening to somebody else talk. Conversation didn't have nothing to do with me. I didn't even get to jump into conversation. But I heard them talking. They was talking about forgiving somebody, right? And I've always known that when you forgive somebody, it's, it's, it's as if it never happened. That's the example that you get from the Most High. Read your Bible. It's wiped away. It never happened. Now, as a human being, we can't wipe it all away. We can't wipe it all away. But over time, we got to practice it and not treat that person any different based on that particular transgression as we see it, right? But I wasn't doing that. It was some deep seeded down in me. That seed had been planted. That seed of unforgiveness had been planted in me. Now, this person that told on me, they, they were not the reason that seed was planted in me. Something had happened to me. And it wasn't important that I knew exactly when it happened and who did it. But I knew that I had a seed of unforgiveness running around inside of me. And that seed of unforgiveness didn't allow me to do the right thing in this instance. So I got to thinking, how many other times in my life has something happened to me? And I looked through this filter of unforgiveness and didn't do the right thing. And it led me to do the wrong thing and continue to do the wrong thing. How many times? I just couldn't count them all. I don't know when this seed of unforgiveness got planted in me, but what I've learned is that I got to get it out of me because it doesn't matter if the person that did something to you is responsible for that interaction that allowed that, that seed to be planted in you. It doesn't matter if that person is responsible or not. If you're treating that person with a spirit of unforgiveness, guess what? You're not going to be forgiven. It doesn't matter the situation. See, because that seed of unforgiveness becomes your filter. And you see everything through that filter. And you might pretend that you forgive somebody. You might say that you forgive somebody, but you really don't deep down. The behavior does change. You distance yourself from them. You might not call them. You might not speak to them in the same way. You speak to them when people are around, but behind their back, you talk about them. All of those types of things come from a seed of unforgiveness. You reap what you sow, and that seed of unforgiveness had been sown deep in me, and I had conducted my activities, I had conducted my life based on that seed of unforgiveness, and it didn't matter that that dude told on me. The bigger picture was this, y'all. I had been living my life in a way that wasn't honest 
And it wasn't about being honest with everybody around me. It was about being honest with myself. It wasn't. About, it was about me. I wasn't being honest with myself. I knew how to pretend that I had forgiven this man and all the other people that that I felt that had offended me, but I had never really forgiven him, and it scared the hell out of me. Why? Because I want the most high to forgive me. But I had never really done the one thing that I was supposed to do in order to receive that forgiveness. I had never really forgiven until I learned this lesson. And when I learned this lesson and I started to apply it, I started to see what others did to me is not something that they were doing to me, but they were allowed the most I, the most high was allowing this experience to take place so that I could get right. Whatever he had going on with these other individuals that he blessed to put in my life, to put in my pathway, to allow me the opportunity to forgive for what I felt to be an offense toward me, I was missing. But when I started to understand what that meant, I would forgive people quickly. I started to forgive them quickly. And I wanted to share this with you because I want you to understand something, how serious it is. Somebody that does something to you and you feel offended by it. Trust me when I say this. They're not doing that to you. The universe is allowing this experience to happen so that you will have the opportunity to become the best version of yourself by doing what? Forgiving them. Okay? So remember that, y'all. Get that seed of unforgiveness out of you because it would lead you to being untrustworthy, untrusting, deceitful, manipulative, selfish, and all of those types of things. Get it up out of you and you will be a better version of yourself for it. I'm going to wrap this up with that, y'all. This has been another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker, and I say peace, y'all.